Wow, what a joy to be here with you, Jenny, because you're not only a wonderful ministry partner, but you're a dear friend. We've known each other for a long, long time. Yeah. A long time. (laughs) Oh, we've been doing this a while, Lisa. (laughs) We have. Um, I am very excited about your new book, Untangle Your Emotions. And I love the subtitle because you follow that um, all the way through the book. And I love it. So it's naming what you feel and knowing what to do about it. And of course, in each chapter, you're focusing on notice, name, feel, share, choose. And I love that. And I love the way they um, highlighted which one we're covering in which chapter. It's just really fantastic. Ah, that means a lot to me from you. Okay, so we're going to start out and I'm going to ask you your least favorite question. You ready for that? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Jenny, how does this make you feel? (laughs) It is my least favorite question, but I will say I've gotten way more comfortable with it. So this question most often um, was asked to me by my counselor who was looking for a lot of feeling and I didn't feel it. And that was really hard for me, but I do feel better now. And so I would say today, I feel really happy to be talking to my friend who I love. And I feel really grateful for this season that we're in right now. Our grown kids are nearby. You get that. It's fun. Um, I feel, I feel like it's a good day. That's awesome. So I'll do a check-in with you. Um, How do I feel today? Today, I feel excited about living in answered prayer Um, and also a bit tired from probably packing my schedule a little too tight, which for me, when I pack my schedule a little too tight, I really do have to watch my emotions because that's one of the number one indicators that uh, my emotions can get all tangled up when I'm tired. And so- How does it come out, Lisa? Oh, okay. Are you turning the interview on me? Yeah. Okay, here's how it comes out. Um, I will get upset about something that I otherwise could normally keep in perspective. Right. But I will, I'll get upset about something and- I will attach it to something bigger. Mm. So in other words, it's not just about the thing that I'm upset about. I'll attach it just that it has some deep meaning. And until I know why this is happening, when it's going to get better, how, if it's with someone else, how we're going to work together to make it better until we can have that depth of a conversation, my thoughts start to spiral and Mm -hmm. my thoughts get caught on a loop. And I can't escape it. And suddenly it went from this little thing to suddenly I've made it a big thing that has deeper meaning and that needs a big conversation to process when in reality, one little thing just needs to be changed. And we don't really need all that attached depth and processing and big emotions. Oh, yeah, that's really good. And a sign that you're really (laughs) self-aware. So yay. (laughs) Um, for me, to say for me, I need to get into my counselor's office, <laughs> right? So for me, it is, I get irritable about mm-hmm. little similar, but I don't over, I don't blow it up. I, it just, I will blow up <laughs> and I, it's not always been the case for me, but that really has been the one lately in the way it shows itself that yeah. I'm yeah. working on. I get it. I get it. Okay. So, Jenny, what did you realize was going on in your own life? I know you said lately you've been recognizing that when you're tired, you blow up or whatever. And so many, so many of us can relate to that. But what was going on in your own life that made you consider even writing a book on emotions? Well, I think it's helpful to first say that a lot of my dearest friends laughed when they heard I was writing a book about emotions because I'm not the best at this. So I was writing a book to my weakness and to really research and understand what what it meant to embrace sadness and fear and worry because I only saw those as negative things that needed to be fixed and pushed away. And what's sad, really a, a grief in my own life today, 
is I, because I wasn't comfortable with those emotions in myself, I often would try to push them away in other people. And I would try to fix yeah. everybody yeah. instead yeah. of what they're feeling, which is amazing because in the work that I did, the Bible and science both will say the greatest road to healing our brain and our health and our emotional health especially is to be with other people in their pain. So for you not to feel isolated in your pain, that actually does heal you. But I needed evidence of that because I didn't believe it. I just felt like, what's the point? Why go back and revisit things from the past? Why sit around and sulk about something? Let's just get over it. You know, I mean, I wrote, get out of your head. You've read that. Like, I was like, let's fix this problem. Like, quit thinking it. Quit being cynical. Be gra- grateful. And all of that is possible and true. I still stand then- by that But that book was way more comfortable for me to live than this book. This book was harder because I I had been trained that that emotions were dangerous and that they are harmful and they really can lead to a lot of negative um, impact in your life. And and certainly that can be true, but that is not at the base of emotions. That is not the truth, that emotions are gifts from God and they're given to us to help us navigate a really mixed up world and to help us connect more deeply with the Lord and with each other. And so that's the goal of emotions. And once I understood that, I had to reframe my life around that. And I had to go, why am I so afraid of these? If they're good gifts that that are given to me to work through and to walk through my life, then maybe I need to pay attention to them. So it was, it was a really transformative two years. I was in a small group with um, several other leaders and so we were living this out together. And that made me a believer more than anything because for the first time, they were kind of forcing me to feel negative emotions about things. And I was watching myself heal. And I was moving from places of anxiety that I couldn't quite understand or mentally um, get out of my head about to places of freedom. And all of a sudden, those triggers didn't cause anxiety in me anymore. So there really was a profound difference in my life that I believe this was worthy to give away to the world. That's great. So was there something specific that you were struggling with that was kind of the catalyst to thinking about all of this? Yeah, so I I was. I was struggling with my work, actually. And I don't even write a lot about that in the book, but um, just I'll I'll be super vulnerable here. Um, The the real catalyst was just I was very um, discouraged and I was... I would say numb and checked out from my life. And so I was tired of work and I was tired of the pressure of work. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to quit. And that was that was a pretty strong feeling and a regular feeling for me. And and yet I did still feel called to it. So I kept going, but but there was just always in the back of my mind this desire to quit. And when I did the work, so I was asked to join this little cohort of leaders and I really went in, we each kind of picked something that we knew needed attention in our lives. And for me, it was, I want to enjoy work. I, I should enjoy work. Mm-hmm. I am doing what I'm made to do and I really love it. I feel God's favor on it. Um, I, I want to work through this. And so when I, when I began that group, I remember sharing very vulnerably all of that and really, I mean, hitting the table and crying and being so angry and feeling like what I felt like at the time was I had gone out, if you know the song Oceans, um, mm-hmm. I'd gone out where feet may fail and it felt like my feet often failed and it felt like God was nowhere to be found a yeah. lot of the time. So I'm sharing that with tears, with anger, with like, I feel like he, he called me out here and where is he? And after I shared, all my friends in the group, this was like our first gathering we ever met, they began to correct me. They began to fix me. They began to fix my theology and say, God is with you always. Like, you know, you shouldn't feel that way because God is with you. And basically, Lisa, they did to me what I do to other people. And it felt terrible. Wow. And I felt misunderstood. And I wanted to push away. And I wanted, I felt, I felt angry. I felt like I regretted sharing all of that. I knew the truth. It's not like I don't know the theology. I (laughs) know the theology. I went to seminary. I know the truth. And I believe the truth on a very deep level. I believe that God is always with me and always for me. But what I was experiencing was valid too. And it was was, um, a bid for connection with them. 
And praise God, we did have a counselor there with us. And he interrupted and just said, okay, I want y'all to change from saying I think to I feel. Rather than telling Jenny what you think about what she just shared, I want you to tell her what you feel about what she shared. And Lisa, I have chills thinking about it. It was the most profound 10 minutes of my life. Wow. They begin to say things like, um, I feel sad that you felt so alone. I feel um, angry that you have, you've, you've been in this position and not been able to share with anybody. I feel um, sad that we made you feel pushed away and that we, we used words Lord. that weren't helpful. And all of a sudden, I felt unbelievably safe. I mean, in a minute, it all changed. And so that was when I was like, okay, there is something to this. Right. Lauren was those who there is something to that verse. There's something to actually being in feelings with other people that actually begins to heal your soul. I don't know if you've ever felt this, Jenny, but sometimes as a Christian leader, especially in a situation like you just described, where I'm with other leaders, I get a little, I'm a very vulnerable person. And so I'm willing to share, but I hold back being honest about my exact feelings because sometimes emotions can feel to me spiritually immature. Mm, yeah. And like I just haven't matured to the point where I don't feel angry or I haven't matured to the point where I feel gratitude all the time or I haven't matured to the point where I can better manage my disappointments and all of that. And, you know, so my journey has been recognizing that it's not a sign of mm. immaturity, spiritual mm. immaturity. It's actually a sign of emotional wisdom. Mm. And it's a wow. sign of self-awareness. And I think self-awareness is a, bi a big precursor to self-control, which obviously is a fruit of the spirit. Right. And so when I started processing my emotions that way, I recognize that I had some faulty belief systems about emotions and it was hindering me from those deeper connections like what you just talked about it was necessary for everyone to get vulnerable in the expression of what they felt not necessarily vulnerable with all the details of their life but the expression of what they were actually feeling it and I know a big thing for you in this book is helping people name the emotion yeah. they felt. Now, mm -hmm. I have a confession. Um, I, When I was raising my kids, I look back and there is one thing, there's probably several things that I would change um, looking back now, but there's one big thing I would change. And that is, I remember when my kids would express sadness, disappointment, or something that smelled mm -hmm. a little bit like, ungratefulness, you know, mm -hmm. to me, yeah. I wanted to do a pep rally and I wanted <laughs> to say like, no, 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 you're not sad. We have the joy of the Lord. No, 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 no. You're not right. disappointed because look at all we have to be grateful for, you know? Yeah. And I remember yeah. when one of my kids went to some intensive therapy because, you know, with my family story, um, when my marriage fell apart, there were ramifications for everyone in the family. And so um, one of my kids went to therapy and came home and just said, hey, mom, I realized for the first time it is OK for me to say that I'm sad because I actually yeah. do feel sad. And yeah. I was able to have a moment with um, my daughter and just say, you know, I recognize that I did that. But, and to some extent, I still do it. And I mean, I'm going to really work on that. So that's I the magic. I mean, that that magic right there, that's the hope. Because as people are reading this book, so often what they realize is, wow, first, I never felt permission in my home growing up either to feel that way. And so this is universal nearly. And and then the next thing you think is, and I didn't let my kids feel sad or worried or angry. And and so there, that that is so normal. And I think what I've learned at this stage in life with older kids is the 
beauty and the depth of a relationship that can come from owning mistakes right. and saying exactly what you just said. I want to work on that. And still, my daughter will correct me. She's the most emotionally intelligent one in our home. And my <laughs> oldest, he will just correct me. And she'll be like, mom, you're trying to fix me. You know, she'll just. And so I just think th- this is a messy road because we were not trained. We were conditioned from young ages to judge any negative emotion in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we judge it in the world. So there's a lot of grace here. I hope that one thing people feel when they read the book is just tremendous compassion. Mm -hmm. Compassion for yourself as you go, man, I haven't ever felt my feelings in a healthy way. Or I've felt them and they've led me off cliffs over and over again. And I want to learn how to handle them better. It really can speak to both ends of the spectrum because both ends of the spectrum, whether you've suppressed and concealed and controlled your emotion or you've, you know, been very loud and wild with your emotion, both can come from a place of unhealth where you just don't know what to do with it. And so, you know, I think oftentimes it's way later in life when we learn that. And so, yeah, we we get to go back and apologize. That really is a beautiful story, though. It's it's a sad story. And I know why you feel like it's sad, because no, I, I feel that same sadness. I wish I could go back. But I also believe like our relationship yeah. is is even closer because we're we talk about all these things now. Yeah, I agree. So what are some signs that someone needs to read this book? Like, I don't want to call them emotionally unhealthy because honestly, I know that I need to study this. And I'm so thankful that you've written a book so that I don't feel like it's all pointed at me, but we're in this together, you know? But what's a sign that someone can recognize in themselves that, hey, there's some emotional unhealth here and I need to tend to my emotions and reading this book would be a great thing for me to do right now. Well, let me speak to yeah. to maybe some fears people might have first. So yeah. maybe you're someone that thinks, I never show emotion. And mm-hmm. that's okay. I'm not very emotional. And I would just argue that you are emotional, that God built you in his image and he is emotional. So let me just clear the deck of like, th- this, this actually is for any human because all humans have emotions. And all humans, largely, we have not been trained well about what to do with them. Many of us have gone to therapy, and it's fun. One of my friends wrote about the book and the ba- put it at the back of the book, this is worth thousands of dollars of therapy. And it's true. And I'm a believer that every single person needs a counselor. At some point in your life, you need to be under the care of somebody helping you understand yourself in a deeper <laughs> way. Because we are not good at understanding ourselves. We're not. We are. And so what a counselor or a third party can do is to help you see yourself more clearly, which scripture is clear about, that we are supposed to look in a mirror and not just walk away, but to actually confess sin and to change. Yep. And so that is that is a spiritual practice to be aware of your weaknesses, to be aware of how you come across. I always tell people, if you think you don't need this book, why don't you ask the people around you that are closest to you, that you live with, your roommates or the people you're married to or your kids and say, do you feel like I'm an emotionally healthy person? And see what they say, if they feel safe enough to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. And and there's, I mean, that's one way to find out. Like, do, do I need to grow in this area? And I think we all need to keep growing in this area. For the rest of my life, I just wrote a book on emotions. And for the rest of my life, I will be getting better at this. It is not something that you ever arrive somewhere because you have new emotions mm-hmm. and you have new things that bring out other emotions. And so rather than fear it or feel like we've got to accomplish something or arrive somewhere, I think a better way is what I wanted to do was provide a guide for your journey. You are Mm. on an emotional journey, every single person. And what I wanted to do was give you handles. I wanted, I'd read so many books in my research and I appreciate them all. It's a lot of counselors and there's a lot of feelings and there's a lot of, but I was turned off by it as a fixer because I was like, I just want somebody to tell me what to do. And I know they probably all would judge that, but I, that's what I needed. And so that's what I wrote. And so for me, it was like, let me just give you some simple handles to notice. Let me teach you how to notice what you're feeling. Cause you may not know, or you may say, oh, I feel all the time. I feel all this, but you're actually never slowing down to put a word to it and to actually share it and to feel it and to choose what to do with it. So It's a healthy process of like, here's what you do when you feel a little anxious and you don't know why. You pause before you come inside your house and snap at your kids. You take a minute and you notice what you're feeling 
and you consider why you're feeling it and you give it a name and you feel it and you share it with the Lord and then you walk in and you're going to have a whole different experience on the other side of that door just because of that two minute exercise you did in the car. Mm. That's my hope is that we would be able to all universally grow in this area and to quit demonizing negative emotions. I think if that was a takeaway, I mean, I hope pastors read this. I hope leaders of churches read this because I don't think we have a good theology of emotions. And my right. hope is this gives people language and a new category. Because what I did was I took the Bible and I looked at God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and you can't deny they felt all of these emotions and they felt them pretty intensely and weren't afraid to show them. Well, so, God, you know, I do think a big shift has to happen. I think that's great. Um, I think for me, there's a couple of telltale signs that I need to do exactly what you're talking about. I need to take a pause. And sometimes I like to call them holy pauses because I I need some space between what I'm feeling and how I react. And if, mm-hmm. I, if I can give myself just a little bit of space, then I'm able to better understand what my emotion is doing. Because sometimes my emotions, I feel like are a driving force for me to have yeah. reactions that I may regret later or that really were just out of out of some intensity that if I can just have a little bit of a pause, the intensity quiets down so I can, I can have a little bit better reaction. And, um, so I think for me, when I recognize this, when I start personalizing what other people are saying, that's, Mm. that's where I know I'm like, Oh, I need to, I need to pause and not immediately get defensive. I'm like, well, I didn't say that or like, what, um, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not defensive, you know, I don't personalize. And my kids, if they're listening to this right now, they're going to be laughing um, because they want to inform me of something. And then right. I want to personalize it and immediately get defensive. And that's where I know like, wow, this is a, this is a little space that I need a holy pause. And maybe I need to um, ask myself some questions, just like you were saying, my counselor, Jim Cress often encourages me get curious, not furious. Mm, that's and good. So instead of immediately getting furious yeah. about something that triggers a strong emotion in me, if I start asking questions, and here's some good questions to ask, like help me understand, mm. or can you clarify? You know, and th- those kinds of things um, really help me. What are some of the favorite tools that you teach in the book? that um that you feel like will be those practical um pathways or like you said you want this book to guide us into healthier processing of our emotions so what are some of the your favorite practical things to do so i think there's several in the book and i i hope it feels insanely practical especially the second half of the book so the first thing is just to understand the five steps the first step is to notice And that begins really simply. Are you okay? Are you not okay? And then the second one is to name it. And in the book, um, I talk about different feelings and lay out sadness, four main feelings. And every single book had a different number, but I liked four because I could remember four. Sad, afraid, um, uh, happy, and angry. And so under each of those in the name chapter is a list by varying intensity of more specific words to choose from for your feelings. Because sometimes I just need a guide. I just need a word. Like I go, okay, that's the one I feel, right? Um, and then, and so to, to really narrow it down, because you could be feeling, you could be feeling disappointment over not being included in a friendship gathering, or you could be grieving a loved one that you've lost, you know, two years ago and it's coming back up again. So, not just saying sad, like <laughs> sad, it could be either of those disappointment right. or grief. So really narrowing down. And I have a lot of those words and tools in the book. And then the next step is to feel it. And this was a hard one for me because what do you do? Like, how do you even do that? And so just to take a minute, to take a beat and to go, okay, I, I'm not going to feel every feeling when it comes at me, but there's going to be times where I choose it's time. I need to work through this. I need to feel this. And it can be as simple as getting, turning up a worship song in your car or laying outside in your backyard or just doing something where you can be alone and to actually feel it. 
And that can scare people. I know that. Um, but I promise you that step is going to bring you that connection with the Lord and ultimately in the next step with other people, which is to share it, to share it with somebody. And not to share every feeling you feel. It could be a mood. I mean, it'll pass fast. But but if it's one that has lingered more than a day or two, it's time to share it. You need to tell one of your friends what's going on. And if it's an extreme emotion that you're feeling, of just today, one of my best friends called me and I pick up and I was like, hey, and she's weeping. I mean, she's bawling. Right. And I am so in awe of that, that she just called me in the middle of a cry, right? That's so brave. But that sharing is yes. she knows yes. that that brings healing for her. And so she's not afraid to do it. And so we share it. And then lastly, we make a decision and we choose what to do with it. Right. And that that isn't always simple. For many people, this journey, for my husband, I talk about his story in it. It might be that you're in a point of clinical depression or anxiety and you really need help. You need medicine or a doctor. You need a counselor. You need real help. And, and so it's important that you take that step of choosing, you know what, this has become a stronghold in my life. This is an emotion that has moved from something I feel to something that's controlling me. And it's okay. Like this happens. This happens because of our chemistry. This happens because of suffering over a long period of time. This happens because the world is broken, but we need to get help. And so choosing what to do with it can be as simple as making a doctor's appointment, or it could be choosing not to yell, just like you were talking about, like not to react or overreact. But to go, you know, I'm going to feel this and I'm going to share it in a vulnerable way. And a good example of this is if you have um, if you have a relationship where you're really close and you get mad at someone, but it's really coming from something in your childhood where you felt the same way. You felt trapped. You felt like you had no control over the situation. And you say to your friend or to your spouse, instead of reacting, you say, you know, this is reminding me of a feeling I felt when I was 12. And I know you're not trying to make me feel this way, but man, it's coming up strong right now. Can I have a little time to to process? All of a sudden, you just switched their reaction to you into one of compassion. Girl. <laughs> you have to be self-aware enough to notice that. And that process can help you do that. And the more you practice that process and those simple steps, the easier they become to where you can do them more quickly in your mind and your body. You can notice and name and feel and share and choose <laughs> in shorter amounts of time. But it does. it is like a muscle. You have to kind of practice it. <laughs> and grow in it. That's so good. That that helps me so much. And I love the fact that it's memorable. So yeah. now I'll think about this. And throughout the book, you have so much good advice. But one of my favorite things about you, Jenny, is it is practical. It is memorable. And it's personal. And yeah. so for all those reasons, I think that everyone who reads this book is going to really have some solid takeaways. And it's not going to be a book that you just read, but it really is going to be a message that we sit with, that we apply to our life and and one that we return to. I do think this is going to be one of those evergreen books. It's like, wow, I need to pick that book up and I need to read it again. So Jenny, thank you so much for all the work, all the personal Good. work that yeah. you did um, in order to really be able to live this message in such a beautiful way. Thank you for your honesty that you still have pitfalls and times that you don't get it right, because that gives us hope for those of us who recognize we're not going to get this right all the time either. Um, yeah. And for all those reasons, thank you. This is a treasure. Yeah. You are a treasure. Oh, and I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for having me.